I believe the last thing anyone in their right senses should do is challenge cartel members as they wield dangerous power such that even the authorities cannot touch them. Well, some brave individuals have dared Mexican cartels and they still live to share their stories. Today, we'll be looking at Hell's Angels members who challenged brutal Mexican cartels and still survive to tell the tale. Tragic death of Hell's Angel members. If you try to compare the Hell's Angels and the Mexican cartel, Hell's Angels don't stand a chance. To start with, Hell's Angels is more of a motorcycle gang that looks out for their members and fights with other violent biker gangs. Cartels, on the other hand, operate on a higher level of violence and are filled with military deserters, serial killers, and ruthless hitmen known as Sicario. Another factor that puts Mexican cartels way ahead of the Hell's Angels is finances. Since cartels control the sale and distribution of drugs in the United States and several other countries, they have a lot of resources to unleash terror and cause civil unrest. They also have access to firearms and ammunition. A motorcycle group like the Hell's Angels would never lay their hands upon in decades to come. Money is power, and if we are being honest, the cartel seems to have both. While some Hells Angels members can be ruthless and powerful, it doesn't change the fact that they are regular motorcycle riders with little or no experience in the crime world. The few among them who happen to know a bit about the crime world perhaps get to carry out hits for Mexican cartels like we saw in the case of El Chapo. During one of El Chapo's trials, there were claims that he once hired Canadian Hells to kill a drug dealer, but the hit never went ahead. However, it seems that was not the only time Mexican cartels and the Canadian Hells had a deal. There have been indications that Canadian criminal groups like the Hells Angels have expanded their drug operations by dealing directly with Mexican cartels. By dealing with Mexican cartels directly, they get to remove middlemen from the trafficking chain, thereby increasing their share of profits. However, the authorities didn't get wind of this partnership until things went south and cartel members began to kill Canadian gang members out of the blue. On September 27, 2009, two members of the Canadian Hells Angels were brutally murdered by gunmen who fled in two cars after the shooting. The Mexican embassy in Canada, while speaking about the incident, stated that it appeared like the victims and the gunmen gunmen had a score to settle, which later resulted in the murders. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police believed that the two victims involved in the shooting were in Mexico at the time to carry out a drug-related job and had been on their radar for some time before the murder happened. Kendall Douglas and Jeffrey Ivans were having fun near a condo they shared in Puerto Vallarta, an international tourist destination known for its beautiful beaches, nightlife and resorts, before they got murdered by suspected members of Mexican cartels. According to Diaz Guillermo, a Jalisco state prosecutor, the two held Hell's Angels members were murdered in the apartment they shared. Witnesses gave a more detailed description of the incident. According to the eyewitnesses, Kendall was the first person to go down. A lone man approached them as they were enjoying their time outside the building and shot Kendall while Ivans took to the heels. The armed man chased Ivans to the pool area where he shot him. After neutralizing the men, two other gunmen arrived at the scene and repeatedly fired several rounds of shots at their bodies which were already, or almost lifeless. After committing the daylight murder, the culprits left the scene. When they tracked the plates, they discovered that they belonged to Kendall. Diaz added that Ivan was armed, but didn't get a chance to use his weapon, probably due to the fact he was caught by surprise and couldn't think straight at the time. Let's take it that the deed has been done, but Ivan being armed is an indicator that he was involved in something fishy and knew a day like that could come. In Mexico, it's hard to see a citizen carry handguns around since they are hard to purchase legally and there is only one gun store in the country. It is even more surprising to see a foreigner armed and as expected, Ivan didn't obtain a permit for the handgun. The murders of these two Canadian men raised a lot of questions. What could these men have gotten into that made them a target for Mexican cartels? Why was one of the victims carrying a weapon in a country with strict gun laws? Well, it seems the two victims were not normal foreigners working as construction workers. Court records showed that Ivan's was convicted convicted of possession of drugs for the purpose of trafficking in 2002, according to Sergeant Bill Whalen, a member of the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit, an agency tasked with weeding out and disrupting organized criminal enterprises, Kendall and Ivans had been on their radar for a while before they got killed. A friend of one of the victims revealed that Ivan had moved to the North American country to work as an equipment operator in construction for the Hells Angels. At the beginning of the murder investigations, the authorities were unaware that Ivan and Kendall belonged to a gang and were still yet to figure out the motive behind their murders. However, as time went on, the truth began to reveal itself. Ivan's close friends revealed that he grew up in Kamloops but resided in Kelowna for the past few years, where he worked as an equipment operator for a construction company. A close friend, who wanted his name concealed due to fear of being hunted by gang members, revealed that the former equipment operator relocated to Mexico 
to carry out some excavation works for the Hell's Angels. The friend claimed he predicted the incident would happen and tried to talk him out of it, but Ivan was miserable at the time and probably saw that as the best way out. He also maintained that Kendall and Ivan's were close buddies, but had no idea that Kendall was with Ivan's in Mexico. The anonymous friend added that Ivan's initially struggled with the decision to move over to Mexico and was not in a good state of mind before he left Canada. Ivan's told me that he was really miserable, the friend recalled. He said, I'm just really stressed out and I have a hard decision to make about Mexico. I don't know if I should go. And right away I said, dude, don't do it. It's going to end badly. One thing you should pick from Ivan's friend's testimony is the possibility that Ivan and Kendall both functioned as lower level intermediaries. Since Canadian gangs want to cut off middlemen and earn a higher profit from the drug trade, they need someone on the ground to help them run their business in Mexico. According to Inside Crime, Hell's Angels send low-level operatives like Ivan and Kendall, or people who had fallen out of favor to help coordinate business in Mexico. Since his friend said Ivan's knew about the danger ahead but still relocated, there's a possibility that he didn't have a choice. I think Ivan and Kendall could be one of the people who had fallen out of favor or owed the gang money. This would probably explain why he went on the journey, knowing he could get targeted by Mexican gangs, who would kill him to send a message to the senior Hell's Angels members. Low-level operatives like Ivan's and Kendall tend to get the job done, as they can easily blend in as a foreigner while they run point from there. The senior members of the Hell's Angels do not have this luxury. They can't enter the country without raising suspicions or end up being hunted by the Mexican authorities. Their presence may even jeopardize the mission. They oversee operations in Canada, but have boots on the ground in Mexico, ensuring the smooth flow of the business. This strategy has helped Canadian violent gangs and Mexican cartels carry out transactions successfully. Another sign that Canadian violent gangs had struck a deal with Mexican cartels is the fact that Canada is now playing a bigger role in helping cocaine reach Europe and Australia. Canada is the second biggest source of cocaine for Australia, right after Chile which is the main stop for cocaine on its way to Australia. Canada has gone up three spots on the list since 2010, which means it's become more important in this illegal activity. There are also reports that Canadian drug traffickers have made Australia their go-to place to sell drugs because of the exorbitant prices they get to sell those substances. For example, a kilo of cocaine can be sold for up to five times the amount it is sold in Canada. This has increased the presence of Canadian drug traffickers in the world's sixth largest country. I feel that Canadian gangs are making a lot of money from the drug business. Imagine buying at a cheap price, since they are dealing directly with a Mexican supplier and selling for five times the price. This probably explains why the police traced a Ford F-350 Super Duty pickup truck, a Hummer, and a Mercedes-Benz registered to Ivan and Kendall. It means even though Ivan and Kendall were low operatives, they probably had a significant amount of money entering their accounts since they ran the business in Mexico for the Hells Angels. However, the Canadian Hells Angels denied claims that Ivan and Kendall were members of their group, and this doesn't come as a surprise. It is common for gangs to deny their members when issues like this happen. A spokesman for the Hells Angels, told the Star newspapers that he had never heard those names. If you think the worst Mexican cartels do to their victim is kill them, well, you are wrong. What they did to Ivan and Kendall is one of the least things they do to people who sell them out. In fact, some people have been subjected to more excruciating deaths for lesser crimes. Mexican cartel members are ruthless and can go to any length just to pass a simple message. And one strategy that has worked for them over the years is instilling fear in the hearts of people. This way, they've been able to conquer territory and expand their operations. The murder of Ivans and Kindle are yet to be identified, let alone apprehended, and no Mexican cartel has taken responsibility for the murder of the two Canadian men, Hells Angels and drug trafficking. The Hells Angels have a strong presence in Canada, a country that shares about 13 borders with the United States, making Canada a perfect location that connects to various drug trafficking routes. Since 13 states in the United States share a border with Canada, drug suppliers can use Canada as their point of entry, or even as their final stop. Another factor that could have made the Canadian border a crucial spot to smuggle drugs into the US is the fact that the security may not be as tight as it is on the US-Mexico border. The US to Mexico border has a long history of drug trafficking. As a result, heavy regulations and security have been put in place to crack down on drug trafficking through that route. The Canada to US border may not necessarily have strong border security. Moreover, fewer resources would be dedicated to those borders since they have fewer cases of drug trafficking. Unlike the US to Mexico border, drug traffickers have made Ontario one of the main hotspots for drug trafficking in Canada. All thanks to the 
province's proximity to the U.S. borders and sophisticated transportation infrastructure. The most populous province is known for its sophisticated transportation infrastructure, which includes highways, railways, and ports, giving smugglers a variety of options to consider when moving drugs around and outside the country. Over the years, the Hells Angels have teamed up with Mexican cartels like the Sinaloa cartel to smuggle drugs into Canada and even smuggle them into the U.S. As a result of their criminal activities, the gang is considered by many law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies throughout the world as a criminal gang and not the motorcycle gang they claim to be. Moreover, members belonging to the motorcycle club have often been involved in violent crimes like murder, assault, and robbery. However, the Hells Angels have maintained that they are a group of law-abiding citizens who enjoy riding motorcycles and formed a club to protect their members. They have enough proof to back up these claims as the organization is known for promoting motorcycle safety and racing. They have also supported education programs both in Canada and outside of Canada, not to mention that many of their chapters across the country occasionally get involved in charitable work and community events. While some believe the motive behind these acts of goodwill, especially to their community, is to cover their tracks and make the club look clean, we can't rule out the fact that not all members are involved in criminal activities. Moreover, Membership in the club doesn't necessarily mean you will be involved in criminal activities. It only increases the chances of being mixed with such activities. However, regardless of how hard they claim to be a crime-free organization, a number of their members across the globe have been charged with crimes and eventually convicted at the end of the day. In 2002, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, known as ATF, launched an undercover operation they called Operation Black Biscuit. The goal of the secret operation was to infiltrate the Hells Angels chapter based in Phoenix. The Hells chapter was headed by Ralph Sonny Barger, the president of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, who claimed that the organization was just a bunch of fun-loving guys who just ride motorcycles and nothing more. The undercover operation went active after the country had just witnessed a riot between the Hells Angels and the Mongols outlaw, a rival motorcycle gang. The ATF sent J. Anthony, J. Bird Dobins, a special agent, to infiltrate the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club based in Arizona. Dobins disguised as a gunrunner who worked for the Solo Angels Motorcycle Club and wanted to join the infamous Hells Angels. As expected, that wasn't enough to establish his credibility and earn him a spot in the gang. To sell his cover and earn a full membership of the club, Bobbins staged the fake murder of a Mongol gang member, the Canadian Motorcycle Club's rival gang. My false persona, I went by the name of Jay Davis. The gang members knew me as Jaybird, and I portrayed myself to be a gun runner, um, a debt collector. To sell his story and convince the leadership of the Hell Angels, an agent posed as the Mongol rider and was covered in bloodstains and brains, then snapped and recorded lying lifeless in a shallow grave. To provide evidence and further persuade Sonny and other members of his faction, the agent sent bloodstained Mongols cut leather biker vests with club patches to them. He also added several pictures and images of the staged killing. The motorcycle club was impressed when they received the fake evidence he sent and immediately initiated Dobins as a member of the Hell's Angels. Dobins gathered useful intel and evidence during the 21-month infiltration of the Hell's Angels, most of which came in handy in arresting 16 high-ranking members of the Hell's Angels. The high-ranking members were convicted of various charges including murder, murder for hire, and violations of federal racketeer-influenced and corrupt organization, RICO, laws, and drug trafficking. It is no surprise that the Hells Angels even had a connection with Jimmy Cornoyer's billion-dollar transnational marijuana empire. The drug empire reportedly had ties with the Sinaloa cartel, the Italian mafia, and the Hells Angels. If the group were a club of motorcycle riders as they claim, what business would they have with a transnational drug trafficker? Jimmy Cornoyer was the face behind a huge drug trafficking network that offered operated across several countries and made billions of dollars. The drug baron answered a number of names including Pot Playboy and the King of Pot. The King of Pot was more than a name. You can say Cournoyer lived up to that name. This is because Cournoyer is believed to have smuggled an estimated 109 tons of marijuana into the United States alone. The King of Pot was a native of Canada who after years of struggle became the main cocaine and marijuana supplier to New York and the east coast of the country till he was apprehended. He belonged to a network of criminals that smuggled Canadian ecstasy and marijuana marijuana into New York. They then used the proceeds to buy cocaine from Mexico's Sinaloa cartel, which would be trafficked to Canada. This is where the Hells Angels come in. Once the cocaine is trafficked into Canada, the Hells Angels motorcycle gang transports them across Canada in tractor trailers and trucks. Cornoyer also reportedly worked with New York's Bonanno crime family, an Italian-American crime family 
that dominated organized crime activities in the city of New York. Since Cornoya was a major supplier in New York, teaming up with the Bonanno crime family was a wise decision and may have contributed to the growth of his business in the region. He also worked with Montreal's Rizzuto Club. The King of Pot was also reported to have set aside about $2 million as execution funds to buy people who may want to reveal secrets about his illegal activities. It is chilling to know that Cornoyer's criminal enterprise got him working together with different kinds of connections, including the Hells Angels, Mexican money launders, Native American smugglers, and crime families like the Bonanno crime family and the Rizzuto crime family. Cornoyer went into the world of crime as early as the age of 21. The authorities had caught him with a few marijuana plants in his house in Laval, Quebec, as far back as 1998. While growing up and making a name for himself in the crime world, Cornoyer had found himself on the wrong side of the law and had been to prison several times. However, these didn't hold him back from achieving his goal of becoming a successful drug baron. Cornoyer was clever and managed to build an international drug empire that made billions of dollars. You can say that Cournoyer going into the trafficking world early helped him build a successful drug empire. By the time Cournoyer clocked 30, he was already overseeing a network that smuggled about 450 kilograms of marijuana into the city of New York every week. Cournoyer somehow managed to control both the port authorities and customs checkpoints moving goods in and outside the country without much hassle. As for the port authorities, Cornoyer bribed corrupt officials who ensured the safe passage of his goods. Like I said earlier, he had set aside $2 million for this sole purpose. The King of Pot was a clever one. He knew conducting operations on non-indigenous lands may tip the police about his illegal business. As a result, he targeted sovereign indigenous lands in Canada and carried out drug operations on them. This was a clever choice because places like that have little police or law enforcement presence. Cournoyer was able to avoid detention by the authorities. Since he didn't need to watch his back, he was able to build a billion-dollar drug empire that transported drugs around the globe. Cournoyer worked with notable crime syndicates like the Hells Angels, the Sinaloa Cartel, local American smugglers, and the Rizzuto and Bonanno crime families. According to reports, Cornoyer lived an extravagant lifestyle, dated lingerie models, and even partied with Hollywood actor Leonardo DiCaprio. His lavish lifestyle earned him some connections with many celebrities, such that George St. Pierre, a popular Canadian UFC champion, penned a letter to support Cornoyer during his trials. However, he later apologized to the public after Cornoyer pleaded guilty to the drug trafficking charges. The DEA eventually got intel from Cornoyer's girlfriend, who was angry at him for keeping her in the dark about this side of his life. The information she gave the agency was used to track him and arrest him. The information also came in handy in the arrest of his partner, John Venizelos. Cournoyer was arrested while trying to enter the city of Mexico in 2012. A year later, he pleaded guilty to charges related to money laundering and drug trafficking. The Canadian native is believed to have trafficked an estimated 109 tons of marijuana into the United States from Canada. His billion-dollar multinational drug empire came to an end after the judge sentenced him to 27 years behind bars. The brutality of Mexican cartels. The brutality of Mexican cartels cannot be overemphasized. They can be very ruthless, especially when dealing with betrayers or anyone who attempts to get in their way. Cartels dominate territories by instilling fear in the hearts of residents. In other words, the more brutal cartels are, the more people fear them and listen to them. To live up to the standard, cartel members are always willing to unleash terror and violence even at the slightest provocation. This is why they punish offenders in the most inhumane ways ever. The goal is to indirectly send a warning to anyone who may want to defy their orders or challenge their sovereignty. Let's take for example an incident that happened in the state of Tamaulipas. In 2010, the Los Zetas cartel kidnapped men from passenger buses and forced them to work for them. As for those who stood their ground and refused to work for the cartel, they paired them against one another and forced them to fight to their death with sledgehammers. It was not until a year after the authorities discovered the bodies of about 193 people buried in shallow graves in the country's northern border. Their skulls were observed to have been crushed with sledgehammers. I believe the cartel gang members could have just brought out their guns and killed the men who refused to work for them to make an example out of them. But come to think of it, having them fight each other to death would make more impact than giving them an almost painless death by shooting them. A brutal massacre like this is a message from the cartel to people who may refuse to work for them in the future. The Mexican cartels are a crime network infamous for their criminal activities 
including assassinations, kidnappings, turf wars, and most importantly, drug trafficking. Drug cartels in Mexico control up to 70% of drugs being smuggled into the United States. Mexican cartels wield a lot of power and influence than you may have imagined. They are not your regular street gangsters like the Hells Angels. They stand for something way larger. This explains why the government is still yet to take all of them down completely. Although they have made some notable progress in that regard, the crime world is still dominated by a number of Mexican cartel top leaders. In fact, a number of them have connections with high-ranking government officials, especially in Mexico. Mexican cartels, however, do more than move drugs across the United States and other countries. They oversee the world's largest illegal drug market and control a significant amount of illicit drugs smuggled into the US. It is believed that the cartels make half of their revenue from cannabis. However, they deal with other drugs like cocaine, heroin, and meth, with the United States as their primary market. Operating beyond the shackles of the law, the Mexican cartels also spearhead illegal activities like racketeering, money laundering, extortion, kidnapping, and assassination. Achieving these goals entails establishing a network of illicit associations to facilitate the distribution of illegal narcotics across the United States. These networks encompass American prison gangs, street and motorcycle-based criminal groups, and even members of the formidable Latin American gang. Cartels have been able to secure their dominion and gain control in their communities all thanks to their excessive use of violence in individuals. The few people who are brave enough to confront them are used as scapegoats. They kidnap and kill rival gang members, civilians, police officers, enforcers, anyone that comes in their way. While cartels are known generally to be brutal, Mexican cartels operate on a higher level of violence. For the Mexican drug syndicates, it's all about crime, corruption, eliminating competitors, gaining control, and making money from their operations at the end of the day. As a result, they can go to any lengths to ensure they remain at the top of the drug supply chain. Chain. Many times, innocent people get caught up in the middle of some of these violent turf wars, which is a result of the cartels battling for dominance. Vives acostado al lado de un cuerpo, ves cómo matan a la gente, pruebas la carne humana. In 2006, the country experienced a shocking incident that frightened even the toughest individuals. Five armed men stormed a bar in Europan in central Mexico and tossed five human heads on the dance floor. The perpetrators left a note on the scene which read, The family doesn't kill for money, it doesn't kill women, it doesn't kill innocent people, only those who deserve to die. Since the incident, ritualistic mutilations began to become a norm in the country. It seems that Mexican cartels have observed that facing the government face to face is more risky and most times they lose a number of their gang members to the shooting. As a result, instead of confronting the army, they resort to other ways to spread fear and terror. Killing people in inhumane ways and ensuring they die in excruciating pain seems to make people afraid. During a weekend in 2012, the authorities discovered 49 headless, handless and footless bodies dumped beside a road in Monterrey. This is a familiar practice. Mexican drug cartels usually drop dead bodies by the roadside to send a warning to rival gangs. The Los Cetas gang left a banner at the scene where the mutilated bodies were found as a way of taking responsibility for the gruesome serial massacre. The incident is believed to be an outburst of the escalating war among drug gangs in the area. However, that was not the worst they had experienced. A week before that, the authorities had recovered 18 mutilated bodies in abandoned vehicles near Guadalajara, Mexico's second largest city. A week before the Guasalaraja incident, nine bodies were found hanging from a bridge. And in another incident, 14 heads were found in ice cases outside a local government office in Nuevo Laredo. Several grocery stores, cars, and buses were set on fire in Jalisco, Guanajuato. The authorities believe it was a retaliatory attack from the Jalisco Generation Cartel, a Mexican cartel faction that operated in the area, in response to the arrest of Ricardo Ruiz, also known as the YouTuber. Ruiz was one of the highest members of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel and was arrested for his involvement in the cartel's propaganda videos. The siege lasted for at least eight hours and left 13 members of the CJNG dead. One thing to pick from this shootout is how fearless cartels have now become. They also reportedly used high-caliber weapons during the shooting. Suffice it to say that this was not the only time cartels challenged the Mexican army to prevent them from arresting one of their own. The same thing also happened during the arrest of Ovidio Guzman, El Chapo's son. This was more recent as it happened in January 2023. The drug kingpin's son was arrested in Sinaloa for allegedly taking over his father's drug empire and was scheduled to be flown to Mexico City via a military plane. During the transportation of a video to the country's capital, members of the Sinaloa cartel set up roadblocks, set cars ablaze, and attacked 
parked planes at the Culican airport. A plane was about to take off from the local airport when the shooting began. Two military planes that got hit had to opt for an emergency landing. Afterward, gunfire exchanges took place between the Mexican security outfits and suspected members of the Sinaloa cartel. El Chapo's son was eventually extracted by helicopter to the capital. The shootout left 29 dead, 10 soldiers of the Mexican army, and 19 Sinaloa gang members. Cartels confronting the government on several occasions have raised questions on whether they only want to control the drug trade, or they also plan to control government policies. They have spread their wings beyond the four walls of Mexico, and after conquering Mexico, they probably want to control neighboring countries as well. The bigger they get, the more difficult it is for the authorities to take them down. Mexican cartels known for being brutal include the Zetas, the Sinaloa Cartel, the Gulf Cartel, and CJNG, among others. The series of violence in Mexico is a result of turf wars between several cartels who are battling for dominance, and the goal of every cartel is to be the top supplier of drugs to the United States. Philip Cauldron, Mexico's former president, did a whole lot of operations to take down cartel operations. Unfortunately, his efforts somehow added more fuel to the fire. As it stands, it seems the violence in Mexico would still go on for a while as cartel gangs still have control over a significant amount of territories. Journalists meet their ends when they ask too many questions or try to dig too deep into some matters. Some innocent citizens are gruesomely murdered for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and in some cases, they brutally get rid of people just to prove their sovereignty in their territories. A number of government officials now work with cartels since they know. They may lose their family members if they refuse to accept bribes. Fear has eaten deep into the hearts of everyone, and people would now listen to cartels than orders from the government. And that's it on Hell's Angels who challenged brutal Mexican cartels. If you want to watch similar videos, click on one of the cards on the screen.